Well, okay, I think we can uh, we can start. So, uh, so first of all, welcome to everyone to the first uh, colloquium of CQT of 2022. Unfortunately, still uh, online. Let's hope that uh, this uh, tradition of, will finish in 2022. Uh, so today's speaker is uh, Jerome Fest from the ETH Zurich. Uh, Jerome studied in. Uh, uh, like me, he studied in Lausanne and he also did his PhD in Lausanne, although a few years earlier. <laughs> then uh, he uh, went for his postdoc to uh, IBM Rüschlikon near Zurich, after which he moved to Bell Labs in, um, in the US for another postdoc. And then he came back to Switzerland for a professor position in Neuchâtel in 1997. And then in 2007, he moved to uh, ETH Zurich where he is currently. I got it correctly? Oh, no. It's absolutely right. <laughs> um, and uh, okay, so Jerome is uh, probably the, the most uh, famous thing he did is the, all this work on quantum cascade lasers. And uh, okay, of course, he has all other kind of uh, quantum optics and uh, non quantum optics results. And today he's going to speak of something that is uh, it's a rather fundamental uh, flavor, which is the measurement of quantum correlations of vacuum outside the light cone. Jerome, please. Well, thank you, Mariah. Thank you for this for the invitation. First of all, thank you for this very nice introduction and uh, to give me this opportunity to, to talk about those results. It's really nice. Uh, it's also such a, a nice and, and famous place. Um, so before I start, I would just, just like to, to highlight, of course, the key contribution, because actually what I'm talking about will be mostly the thesis of Fabiana Asetemrini, uh, who is graduating now, but also I would like to stress um, the contribution of uh, Alexa Herter, who just started, um, but also uh, Christina Benea-Schelmus, who's now uh, started a professor position at DFL, and who really was, uh, you know, the engine, if you want, or let's say the, the key person starting that uh, project initially. Um, but also a collaboration with uh, Professor Stefan Buhmann and his student Frieder Lindel, who um, basically uh, helped us a lot with the theory. So it was a very, it is a very nice collaboration. So what I would like to talk about today is indeed rather fundamental because it's about uh, vacuum fluctuations and you know who can you measure? Who can you measure the correlation? What does it mean to mean to make the, to measure the correlations of vacuum fluctuations? Um, so what we will first, just an introduction word, we will do that in the terahertz frequency range. And just to remind you uh, which frequency, those are electromagnetic waves, and basically uh, they correspond to frequencies as their name indicate roughly between 100 gigahertz to 10 terahertz, people talk about terahertz in, in that region. Uh, and what makes this frequency range interesting is that it's really at a crossover between electronics and optics. So, you know, in a sense, it makes it difficult because both electronics runs out of steam in terms of speed and optics has to deal with very close energy levels uh, that makes it also very difficult. But at the same time, the fact that you can combine those two aspects uh, makes it also very interesting. So uh, roughly, we are talking about a radiation which, you know, is, is definitely an energy smaller than KT at room temperature. So if you really want to reach the vacuum, which we will do, you have, you have to go in a cold environment. And uh, part of the grander scheme of things, at least on my point of view, was to say, well, what can you do in quantum optics in the terahertz? And in a sense, the first or the simplest quantum state to study is vacuum. So vacuum, of course, uh, as we know, is, is not empty in that sense. So if you, uh, as you know, the, you can write the electromagnetic waves as a, as a harmonic oscillator. And then if you, uh, and each excitation of that harmonic oscillator is, is called a photon. And now, of course, if you remove all photons, you're left with this one half h bar omega, which you can assign to the zero point fluctuation of the electric field. So in that picture, the square, of course, the electric field itself has an average of zero, but the square of this electric field has a non-zero square average. It's, of course, completely random. And of course, because now we're talking about a continuum, 
of frequencies, um, you all, all, always have to specify which frequency region you're, com you're considering this E square um, if you want to have a finite value. And basically, the important dependence uh, of that RMS uh, fluctuation of the field is uh, you know, the integral of uh, h bar omega divided by uh, the volume. And you have to put some sort of responsivity. Now, of course, the mechanical analog of this is simply the zero point fluctuation of the harmonic oscillator, uh, which even when you cool it down to zero temperature will still have this uh, random motion. Now, first of all, how strong is this uh, vacuum fluctuations? Well, in the terahertz, you might consider two different situations. One, if you idealize your system as a cavity. So in that case, you just divide, you express the one half h bar omega as an electric field inside the volume. And there, what is of course important to keep in mind, it will not be uh, the center of this talk, but it's something which you know, we use a lot, is the fact that the vacuum fluctuation field is proportional to one over the square root of the volume of the cavity. So if you're able at constant frequency to reduce the volume enormously in deep sub-wavelength range, then you can actually enhance the vacuum fluctuations. And you can enhance them by order of magnitudes. And now, of course, again, this is not the main focus of that talk, but the reason we are interested in the terahertz is because you can do this using metals, because you can do basically electronic resonators, LC resonators. And in the LC resonators, the field is inside the capacitor. And now you can basically, by engineering your LC resonance, make that capacity, the volume of the capacitor as small as you, I mean, very small. And in that sense, make the volume of the cavity very small. Now, what we will be dealing much more today um, in that talk is about a focused free pulse. So if you have a pulse of light uh, that is focused inside the waist of a, of a beam, then you can ask yourself, OK, what is the strength of the vacuum fluctuation in that volume, well, there you basically simply have to mentally integrate um, the volume, if you want, of a cavity around that pulse. And then you get a vacuum field strength, which is basically given by this formula, which was first discussed by the Rick, uh, Claudius Rick, in the group of Alfred Light and Surfer in the, the science article 2015, which I'll, I will come back to. Well, basically, here the volume, instead of Having the volume down, you have the square of the waist of your beam. And in a sense, the, the, other, the other distance is basically given by uh, the uh, one over the velocity of light times the uh, delta. So um, in that case, you would just think about something like a voltmeter at one terahertz. Whereas if you make sub-wavelength cavities for the same type of frequencies, you can go to kilovolt per meter. Now, what kind of physics, even though those vacuum fluctuations are random, they, uh, of course, you cannot extract energy from them, but still they have co consequences in the physics. And you know, the very famous uh, consequences, for example, the spontaneous emission, or uh, even more famous is the Lamb shift. So in the Lamb shift, you take a, the, the, the um, hydrogen atom, and uh, you can show and measure the fact that the 2p3 half is shifted differently than to 2p one half. And as such, you can observe a shift of the, uh, of the um, energy state due to vacuum fluctuation. Now, more recently, uh, there is interest in the vacuum fluctuations, in a sense, in solid state in a general matter. That means in collections of atoms, in collective motion of atoms. And there, of course, there is a very intriguing Casimir force, which is this force that arises when you bring two metallic plates clo close together, such that in a picture you can think there is, you, if you want to remove a phase space for uh, vacuum fluctuations between the plates, and therefore uh, you have less radiation pressure pushing outwards the plates than pushing inwards. This is an oversimplified picture, uh, but still it's sort of the key, the essential effect is that you have a force that rises from vacuum fluctuation. And recently, we've been actually um, looking at the effect of uh, vacuum fluctuations on magnetotransport and in more um, to the point in quantum hole effect. And we actually showed that uh, if you put a quantum hole bar inside a resonator, 
you actually can modify and actually destroy the quantum hole effect because uh, your vacuum fluctuations are long range potentials that basically overcome the topological protection of the quantum hole effect. Now, um, again, as a picture, you can think of this vacuum fluctuation um, in a sense, at least initially, we're going to start with this uh, simplified picture as a noise. If you want. It's like a classical noise. So, um, and T. Welton in 1948 showed that you can actually compute the, sh the lamp shift by simply assuming that, um, in a sense, the energy shift that you observe uh, between this 2s1 half and 2p3 half of the um, level of the hydrogen atom is basically arising from a dynamical stock shift uh, that is coming from this AC field. So um, now let's keep this in mind and ask ourselves, OK, can we measure those fluctuations? And you know, the first remark, of course, is that there is no way that you can measure vacuum fluctuation with an intensity detector, because you cannot extract energy uh, from the vacuum. And what will be the theme of this talk is really the idea of using a field detector, not an intensity detector, that uses the so-called Pockels effect. So in the Pockels effect, what you have is you have an electro-optic material uh, in which, if you apply an electric field in one direction, it basically changes the birefringence. It creates a birefringence such that if I introduce a linear polarization, I end up with an elliptic polarization. Um, now, this effect is usually rather small. And you basically have a refractive index difference between the two uh, axes of your crystal uh, that is proportional to the applied electric field. Now, even though this is a very small effect, it's still heavily used. And you know, all the telecom, for example, the modulators in the telecommunication, they are using this Pockels effect. Now, how can you measure a, you know, a terahertz field with that? Well, what you do is you basically choose correctly your crystal. You choose your crystal such that the terahertz, a terahertz wave that would propagate inside this linear crystal would propagate at the same speed as a very short pulse that you've created with a short pulse um, femtosecond laser. And so what you do is you shine onto your crystal both a terahertz wave and the near infrared uh, beam. And once they actually have crossed the crystal, because they cross at the same velocity, um, the near infrared short pulse, in a sense, sees a kind of equivalent DC field. And it sees the DC field that is corresponding to the terahertz wave at that location, and therefore rotates uh, its polarization according to how much that field is. Now, you basically do an ellipsometry measurement afterwards using quarter wave and Wollaston prism, and you detect the difference in the two, um, you know, you, if you have no, you, you manage such that if you have no field, you have a perfectly uh, circular polarization and any little field will transform this linear polarization to an elliptical one. And by measuring the difference between the photo current in both directions, in the polarization direction, you get a direct signal, which is proportional to the electric field. So um, what is actually interesting that measurement is that you have a current which is directly proportional to the electric field. And what is also uh, very important is that your detector, because it's a balanced detector, uh, the noise of that measurement is shut noise limited. So even though your effect is originally very small, it is actually quantum limited in that sense. It's quantum limited in the sense that you're limited by the number of photons that are in your uh, probe pulse. Um, so in that sense, the, the two key elements that you have, because I'll come back to that at the very end of the talk, is that there are phase modulation, and then you convert this phase modulation into an amplitude modulation. Now, in a landmark experiment, the group of Alfred Leitensdorfer, they took um, the extreme case, if you want, and they said, well, it's interesting, because of course, if I have um, a technique that allows me to measure the field, if I have the vacuum fluctuation, I should add an extra noise to that field measurement. So in a sense, 
the idea being I simply measure nothing and I measure the noise of that nothing. And the noise of that nothing should contain the noise of the measurement plus the noise due to the vacuum fluctuation. So they did that using extremely, uh, they enhanced the vacuum fluctuation by simply considering extremely tiny uh, volume, if you want, effective volume of measurement by working with extremely short pulses. So they use a six femtosecond pulse. And this is of course, uh, if you want the, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, techniques that uh, the group of Alfred Leitensdorf handles very well. So they used the extremely short pulse. And they showed that, of course, if you have such a short pulse, the vacuum field fluctuation in that short pulse corresponds to about two kilovolt per meter. And the noise e equivalent field due to the shot noise of the detector was uh, only three times larger, 6.5 kilovolt per meter. And, the, you know, in this way, they could measure a tiny excess noise due to the vacuum fluctuation of 4%. And that's what they show here. You know, the black curve is um, the, if you have the long pulse and the, uh, the green curve is a short pulse. And they basically show that the statistics is a bit broader and that the statistic is broader means simply they have more noise. So um, of course, this was a nice measurement, but you know we were interested in the terahertz and we thought, okay, can we measure that in the terahertz using the te same technique? Um, and actually the answer is very clear, no. Uh, because uh, in the vacuum field fluctuation, as I told you in the terahertz would, it's about one volt per meter, the noise equivalent field, that means the noise of the measurement is 450 volts per meter. So we should in that same technique, um, you know, expect an increase in noise of 10 to the minus six. So this is totally unmeasurable. It's already difficult to measure 4% increase in noise. So 10 to the minus six is completely impossible. And that's how we got to think about correlations. Uh, can't we measure correlation of the field rather than measuring just the field noise? And that um, has actually uh, interesting consequences because you can already ask yourself, well, should I see correlation? And if you think of what I was, you know, this picture of noise uh, of the vacuum fluctuation that I had at the beginning, which was kind of classical noise, I said, yeah, of course I should see a correlation because after all, since I'm measuring over bandwidth, if my two measurements are close enough, you know, they should be correlated. Now, how do you do that first experimentally? So, well, the way to do is to simply instead of doing one measurement uh, using this EO electro-optic sampling, you do two. And we do that by simply having two beams that are coming to the same point, uh, but they are slightly uh, delayed one with the other. And we basically, if you want, we simply have twice the same experiment, but we probe the same place. And there, of course, we benefit from you know, one aspect, which is, uh, you know, kind of hidden, or let's say, which is really an, a nice aspect of this electro-optic sampling is that you're sampling a terahertz wave, which is, you know, hundreds of micron, if not a millimeter wavelength, with a beam, which is at a wavelength of less than a micron, 800 nanometers. And that means that you can probe extremely sub-wavelength space. So if you focus your probe beam, you focus it to a size which is much smaller than the size of the beam you're probing. And therefore it's no problem to basically sample twice the same beam and still separate the two, um, the two beams. So because we are dealing with this very large ratio in wavelength, we are able indeed to probe twice the same volume at two different times. And so that's what we did. We have two beams that are focused at the same place in our uh, electro-optic crystal with uh, simply uh, two pulses that are delayed with each other. And that allows us initially, if we were if, when we're focusing in the same place, to measure the field of the, the correlation between um, the electric field at time t and time t plus tau. Uh, by electronic, of course, we, this correlation is just uh, made completely electronically by acquiring, if you want, those two signals at the repetition rate of the, um, of the laser. Now, um, 
you know, for those of you who still have a bit in mind, um, a electric field correlation that is called the G1 measure. Hmm? So it's the first order field correlation. And this is not the way people usually measure G1. Usually what you do is you take your optical source, take a beam speeder, you delay one of the two beams, recombine them uh, into an intensity detector. And that's how you uh, measure G1 uh, traditionally. Now, of course, that measurement assumes that you have a source which is not vacuum fluctuations because you need to detect the light with an intensity detector. Now, quantum mechanically, you, well, what you do is you, of course, need to apply the E plus and E minus. This is the prescription of Glauber. And if you do that on the vacuum, of course, you get zero. So um, this is where, of course, electro-optic detection is different because now you're not measuring E plus and E minus. What you're actually measuring quantum mechanically uh, is really the total the field. That means you're measuring A plus A dagger or minus A dagger. And in that respect, when you do this computation, as we did, what you can show is that you're measuring the anti-commutator of the field at the two times. And because that anti-commutator contains A dagger, A plus A, A dagger, this thing, of course, is non-zero. And so if you, once you do that for, not for just a single mode, but for many modes, you see that, and you do that for a thermal field, you see that effectively the signal that we should see in the time domain should be um, the sum of a contribution from the vacuum fluctuations. And a, of course, a contribution that comes if you have a thermal field. And effectively what we're doing is we're measuring, if you want, the response of the, the, of the signal, I mean, the response of the um, electro-optic sampling, which has, of course, a finite bandwidth. Now, how do you do that? Well, of course, since we want to measure also vacuum, we need to find a, you know, we need to do the experiment in an, in an environment that we can cool. And so that's why we do it in this uh, cryostat. It's actually an overkill because this is a dilution fridge, but we do all the experiments in the dilution fridge at the same time. So, uh, and what we like with that cryostat is that can let it run for many, many days and, and weeks um, because it's a closed cycle. So what we do is we send our pulse inside the cryostat where we have the uh, zinc telluride crystal. And if you look at the region zero to three terahertz, you see that when you actually cool down your environment to four Kelvin, um, you see that this is the blue line, the occupation uh, number of the photons goes down to zero uh, really quickly. So you don't have to worry about thermal photons there. Uh, and so basically what we have is we, we have a femtosecond laser. I don't know if we see something well. Yeah, we, we have a femtosecond laser on this optical table. We go up to this other optical table, which is on top. This is really a tricky experiment. Um, where we have basically, we split the beam in two, delay one of the two, send to the cryostat, take out and measure in those two detectors which are sitting on top of the cryostat. So of course, the signal is very small. Uh, so we basically have a, as I mentioned before, if you are sampling vacuum fluctuations with electro-optic sampling in the terahertz, your signal of noise is effectively 10 to the minus three. So, your signal is uh, 10 to the minus three times the noise. So the only way to measure something is by integrating. And what we show here is that, um, you know, that's of course, uh, you know, the work of, of Christina Benea is, uh, she basically worked hard to remove all the external source of noise such that uh, you can integrate for a very long time. And if you integrate, um, about uh, 5,000 seconds per point, then you can actually start to be in a regime where this Allen deviation of the field that you measure squared goes into the regime where you measure vacuum fluctuations. Um, and this is the, the first measurements that we did, first at room temperature. And at room temperature, of course, you're dominated by this uh, thermal population. And so now, you know, everything is at room temperatures, the zinc telluride crystal is as room temperature. So what we see, the correlation that you see here is the correlation of a thermal field inside the, a, a single mode thermal field. So it's only multi-mode 
in terms of now the, the frequencies, but in terms of spatial frequencies, it's a single mode. Um, and of course, we see a peak at zero uh, delay, and you know the correlation dec decays, and that gives you in the end this red curve if you do the Fourier transform, um, and that red curve represents, <coughs> sorry, the convolution of the frequency response of the uh, setup times the uh, black body radiation uh, spectrum. Um, now, the of course, uh, when you cool down the cryostat, that's where you should remove completely uh, that uh, contribution from the population uh, thermal pollution of the states. And um, now you should see only vacuum fluctuation. And you know what, of course, in a sense, the tricky aspect of this is that you know we do those this we delay the two pulse and we change the delay such that we have uh, now this blue line, which is this uh, autocorrelation as function of time. And each time is uh, 11,000 seconds integration time. Uh, of course, this is not done in one shot. It's done in, in many shots and averaged after words. So it's basically a few weeks of, uh, of measurement time. And it, when you do that, uh, well, uh, of course, you get this blue curve. And when you fully transform it, you see that you have a different shape, uh, which is of course what you expect because you see much more high frequency components because those high frequency components reflect the fact that vacuum fluctuation of course are stronger at higher frequencies than at lower frequencies. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you do a, a simulation at four Kelvin, you see that um, we can actually uh, predict pretty well what we observe. Now, um, the, Next step, if you want, uh, first of all, is to just at the time we started thinking, well, what are we doing now? Um, and I remind you that, okay, we're doing this extremely inefficient measure. Uh, but still, despite the fact that it's extremely weak, uh, effectively, you can very show very quickly that nevertheless, what you see is only due to the fact that by measuring, we actually perturb the system. Because if you think, well, if you just were measuring vacuum fluctuation, uh, then your first measurement would give you a random number. And if your state were still in the vacuum, the second measurement should also give you a completely random number. So I should have basically no correlation between the first and the second measurement. And in that picture, the only reason why we do see a correlation is the fact that we actually um, perturb the system uh, and that is, of course, if you want, given by this a, a dagger term that you have in the correlation. So in a sense, even though what is a bit counterintuitive is even though we have a very weak measurement, still the fact that we do measure something is only due to the fact that we have, uh, when you do a quantum measurement, you of course always perturb the system. And so the second measurement is never done on the perfect vacuum state, it's, it's measured on the perturbed vacuum state. Now, the next step was, okay, to measure spatial currents. And so in that paper, in, the, in, in our first papers to, that we published two, 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 and half, two and a half years ago, or three years ago almost, uh, we did that measurement of correlation, spatial correlation. But we did it with a relatively large beams. And then we started asking ourselves, well, should we observe a correlation between points that are outside their respective light cone? In other words, if I focus my two beams and I basically make them relatively far away, should I see a correlation at that point? And um, that question comes back to a, a very old problem, uh, which was solved uh, you know, by a very famous uh, Enrico Fermi, uh, who at the beginning of the quantum mechanics uh, thought, well, uh, am I, will we get trouble with the quantum, with the relativity when we think about two, atoms, and let's imagine one atom uh, basically uh, emits, uh, you know, is, is basically in the excited state, the other atom is in the ground state. Now, if this first atom emits a spontaneous emission, would I sort of, would the second atom feel this spontaneous emission before, if you want, the relativity allows it? And he showed, no, everything is fine. You have to wait a time, which is just the travel time between the two atoms to start to see, of course, an effect of the first atom to the second. Now there's actually a longer story to that paper because it seems he made an approximation that was a bit 
um, you know, that was not closing all loopholes. And then in the 80s, people sort of worked again in this problem. But the key, the key, the key thing is that, of course, quantum mechanics does not allow you for loopholes for relativity, obviously. But this is also a very difficult experiment to, to conduct if you want to check that, because you know you conceptually need to think, of, oh, I have an atom which is disconnected to vacuum fluctuation, and suddenly at time, well-defined time, I should switch on that. Uh, uh, that connection to vacuum fluctuation. Of course, you could do that with an electric field that, for example, makes a transition that was uh, not allowed into an allowed transition. Those are there are techniques, but it's a very difficult experiment to do. Um, and it also, a bit counterintuitively, does not mean that you do not have correlations between uh, those vacuum fluctuations at two different points. And uh, there's different ways, and, and there's uh, we refer, this is a very good paper of Franzon uh, a few years ago, who discussed that. Uh, one way to look at this, you know, this question whether there is uh, correlations of vacuum fluctuation outside the light moon um, at two different points of space um, is um, basically is, and if you show it, instead of showing it for the electric, electric field, you show it for the vector potential, which makes the algebra easier, uh, you can show that this correlation is actually uh, proportional, uh, is equal in that sense, well, proportional to the propagator, the Feynman propagator for the photon. And the Feynman propagator for the photon do not vanish outside the light. It decreases, but it does not vanish. And so in that sense, the electromagnetic vacuum is correlated. Now, for those you know, who think like, well, how can that be? Um, you have also to realize that something at least that myself made my life a bit easier to uh, realize is that, well, um, it actually works also because in a sense to, re to make, to be able to make the statement that there is a correlation that exists, I need to compare two classical measurements, two, two measurements, and of course, I have to transport information to a common point to compare those two measurements. And that, of course, will always take the time, uh, you know, that, that takes really the, uh, you know, the causality time to do that. So anyway, the, the question is, theoretically, is well known, is well established that there is correlation of vacuum at different points. Uh, but it's, again, one thing which is very difficult to prove because you need this way of turning on abruptly and turning off your um, interaction. So this is where, of course, uh, the technique that we use of electro-optic sampling is really nice. Because what we can do uh, technically is to, um, instead of having our two beams going um, you know, weakly focused as we did in the first experiment, now what we can do is we can <coughs> sorry, focus our two beams using uh, a single lens such that we can have two spots inside the crystals, which are well controlled. The separation is well controlled by just changing those piezomere here. Um, and we basically have to, we now can interrogate our crystal into two separate locations, which we can change uh, the distance. And we basically do the same experiment that we did before, but now uh, probing two different locations. And uh, you know, experimentally, it means that we now have, this is the inside of the cryostat, we have a first lens, we have a second lens, because we need to uh, focus inside the crystal, um, and then we hold the crystal on this four Kelvin plate, such that we now have a, uh, a well-controlled environment. So, indeed, uh, the nice thing was, even if we separate our two beams by 50 micron, which corresponds to a um, a travel time is about 470 femtosecond, uh, even though our pulse is a bit longer than what we uh, said initially, it's, it's up to 200 femtosecond, we basically st still clearly see a relatively strong correlation. Uh, and actually we see a peak of correlation at the zero time difference. So in a sense, we see the peak of the correlation when principle, uh, the two pulses are farther apart from each other in, ta in time space. Time. Now, of course, the difficulty is that those are not points. So when we talk about two pulses, there are two uh, Gaussian beams that are focused over 12 micron beam waste um, at 50 micron from each other in, because each of the pulse 
is about 200 femtoseconds long, it's not, uh, it still has a time uh, dependence. So uh, that's where, of course, um, the con theoretical contribution of, of uh, the group of Stefan Buhmann, and, and especially his very bright student, Frieda Lindel, uh, worked because what they did is they wrote um, a, an ex you know, a, a, you know, a, a a macroscopic quantum electrodynamics approach using Green's function. And that first of all allowed to introduce all those, um, you know, those experimental parameters, the direction of the beam, the focusing and so on, uh, but also uh, written in a form that allows you then to separate the different contributions coming from the causal and non-causal contributions. And so the first thing is that when we do the free transform of that, uh, autocorrelation trace, of course, we get the spectrum. And that spectrum is this full line here. And you see that we have a positive uh, correlation for all the frequencies. Uh, sorry, the um, horizontal axis has now disappeared. Unfortunately, it's like two terahertz. Uh, and this is one terahertz, two terahertz, I think, or one terahertz, one and a half terahertz. Um, and now it goes negative uh, over these higher frequencies which may sound a bit strange, but it is really due to the fact that, of course, you can have perfectly a, a positive cor correlation or negative correlation. Um, we had a bit of an over too strong signal in the low frequencies, which I don't want to take time. We actually showed you can remove that contribution. Uh, we estimated it. And really what is impressive is that the theory now agrees very well with what we actually are measuring. And moreover, um, when you do split the contribution of that correlation, which as I said, is not, uh, it can be positive and negative. What we saw was that the causal contribution, which is in red, which arises from um, the region of space time where the two pulses are, if you want, within, within their light cone, um, <coughs> is actually smaller and has the opposite sign of the non-causal um, contributions. And now the non-causal contributions are the green part. And they are both in this frequency range, both causal and non-causal have the same sign, whereas uh, in this lower frequency region, uh, they have opposite signs. So in the end, we clearly see that we do see the correlation and they are really dominated by the non-causal contribution. So you know what we've done here is that we have observed those correlation uh, of these vacuum fluctuations outside the light cone. And because we see correlations uh, in a pure state, well, you could say, well, since you see correlation of a pure state, it means that that state is entangled. So what is next? How, how could we move further? And there we just like to bring a few ideas that you know, are not especially mine, but they are in the literature. And I found them quite interesting in how we connect to this work to other works. So first of all, uh, I've shown you so far uh, the vacuum fluctuation uh, in a rest frame. Now, if you think of vacuum fields in an accelerated frame, this, of course, um, in an accelerated frame, you see additional effects, which are really quite fascinating. One is the dynamical Casimir force, uh, um, which means simply that if I have a mirror that I'm moving and accelerating very fast, uh, I can actually generate a radiation from that. And as soon as you accept the fact that, of course, if you're an accelerated frame, you will actually convert, if you want, um, the vacuum fluctuations into real radiation, um, you see that, of course, you have the same effect at the edge of a black hole. And at the, at the horizon of the black hole, this is the famous uh, you know, predicted Hawking radiation, um, which is creation of uh, pairs of particles uh, at the horizon, which one goes into the black hole, the other one flies away. And um, a very interesting, at least Gedanken experiment, uh, which in the end was really meant to try to understand better this Hawking radiation was the Enrou-Devitt detection. So here in the Enrou-Devitt detection, you imagine that you have a two-level system that has constant acceleration. And that two-level system in constant acceleration will see actually a black body radiation and therefore will have a finite uh, probability of getting excited. 
Now, in this very nice paper that I really can only recommend of uh, the group of Franco Nori, um, the, they actually showed that those three effects, um, this dynamical Casimir, this Hawking radiation, and the Anuhu effect, they mathematically are all related, and they are related to uh, something that actually you can, I mean, manufacture quite easily and test quite easily, which is a parametric, optical parametric amplifier. <coughs> and that optical parametric amplifier is, you know, the equivalent of a ch child on a swing. So if your child is standing on a swing, uh, it can actually entertain the motion of the swing by swinging himself its center of mass at twice the frequency of the swing. Um, and now that, of course, the question is if you say, oh, uh, can I start the swing? Well, in principle, in a classical sense, you can't because if there is no motion at the beginning, you can move up and down as much as you want, it will never start. Quantum mechanically, however, because of the vacuum fluctuation, you can actually start from vacuum fluctuation. And what you get is this pair of photons, si signal and idler, that corresponds to a, to a mode squeezed state. So why is it relevant to our measurement? Well, it's because electro-optic sampling can be seen as a special case of a parametric process. Uh, because effectively, what we are is we're coming with a near-infrared probe, and we create a pair, one which is a near-infrared probe polarization and a terahertz polarization uh, from the terahertz vacuum. So in that sense, we are also, if you want, extracting photons from the vacuum, or you're amplifying vacuum fluctuation, if you want. So there are actually parallels. Again, this is not our work. This is uh, the work of um, also the group of uh, Voskalenko uh, that showed that you know, there is a strong relationship between the Enhu de Vitt detector, which is a two-level system, and our electropic sampling. Even though, of course, one is a two-level system, we are actually dealing with broadband femtosecond pulse. Um, and of course, the Enhu de Vitt detector is point-like. We have an extended object. But what is important is that those common things, which is the linear coupling with the local electric field, um, a smooth turn on and turn off of the interaction, and an event horizon, uh, which is introduced by the fact that we switch on and off the interaction as we come in and out of the uh, nonlinear uh, crystal. So, in a sense, what we are doing is we can see our experiment as measuring the uh, correlation of two points in space using an Anhu David detector. Um, and of course, you could say, well, what we could do is then basically harvesting uh, the, you know, the entanglement. But now we have to remember that our measurement is very inefficient. And because it's very inefficient, we are not effectively, uh, at least not in, in a measurable way, uh, um, measuring entanglement. So what to go forward, uh, and I'll just spend two minutes on this because my time is running out, uh, just to show in terms of technology, what could be interesting is to develop more efficient measurements. And you know, to make a long story short, it's very simple. I mean, it's very difficult, but at the same time, conceptually, relatively straightforward to do more efficient measurement. What you need to do is to confine the fields. You need to confine the terahertz field. You can do that with an antenna. And you can confine the near infrared field. You do that with a waveguide. And again, what we do, we, we started working on this. And that's mainly a work that now uh, Christina bener chelmus is pushing, is to make devices that uh, combine uh, terahertz antenna and waveguides uh, in a way that we can therefore measure uh, these terahertz fields in a very short way. And um, the first generation of this device uses um, non-air optic elements, um, which are organic type of molecules, which only have only single, they are extremely efficient, but they have a problem that they are not very stable. So uh, with this, we basically could measure, and uh, let me just show you, I mean, you know, this is, this is the typical spectra that we measure with those antenna, this, they peak a bit below one terahertz. And what is, if you want, is quite striking is that in this measurement, we can, of course, averaging, we can measure vacuum electric fields. I mean, we can measure fields that are much below the vacuum fluctuation inside the antenna. 
Uh, and compared to our previous experiment, we can quantify the light matter coupling that we had, which was about 1.6 kilohertz in the experiment I showed you before. Uh, we go to 44 megahertz in this uh, type of devices. So this is a very interesting uh, region because you can rethink now of implementing a measurement that goes to the standard quantum limit. Uh, it's not feasible with the device um, that we had made because it would it basically would be destroyed by the field at the microwatt and we would need a milliwatt to reach the standard quantum limit. Uh, but I think it's a, as a perspective, it's a very interesting uh, direction of thinking, well, what can I do if I'm able to measure electric fields in the terahertz down to the quantum limit, to the standard quantum limits. With that, um, I actually would like to conclude that, you know, with you can observe vacuum fluctuations with electro-optic sampling. Uh, they are both temporally and spatially correlated, and they are also correlated outside the light cone. And uh, that really displays this very special role of correlation of quantum mechanics, which of course, you know, is, uh, is well known in, this, in the context of all these uh, EPR experiments, but still in a sense, um, I don't think it was done already on vacuum fluctuations. And um, it is also this nice aspect of this experiment is that we can do that in free space. Um, and I think um, the outlook for us is to, you know, push this measurement of these broadband fields in the standard quantum limit, and in a sense, further explore vacuum fluctuations <clears throat> in the equivalent of a curve space time using short pulses nonlinear optics. Um, and I know that uh, group in Canada, about Denis Selitsky, he's actually working very strongly on that. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank also my group and especially again, uh, uh, Fabiana and Alexa in the group uh, for really doing this great work. And uh, I'll welcome more questions, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome, for the very interesting talk. Um, the photos, of course, are obviously not taken in Singapore, at least. Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, OK, is there any question uh, from the audience? You can uh, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question, Valerio. Yes, please. Hello. So thank you for the talks. I mean, so uh, yeah, I would like to go back so to, to the, the vacuum field correlation that you measure. So you measure mm -hmm. in time, I mean, in space, basically. Yeah. So if I have an idea of, of the vacuum one has a, has a mode, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, can you say that somehow it's saturated the Heisenberg incertitude? Is it fully limited or something? Is it a relevant question? Um, it's clear that if you want, the reason we see, you, you can ask yourself, because we are able to probe vacuum fluctuations at a sub-wavelength scale, it's clear that uh, we see, uh, and you can check here already, you see, the value of that fluctuation that we see, this, this correlation that we see for that experiment where we have tightly focused beam uh, is something like five volts square per meter square. Uh, and that is actually much larger than what we had measured in, in our initial experiment, which you know, was something like 0.05. So here you see the, the vacuum, the correlation is 0.05. And the reason is, um, in a, a bit in a way I think that you were meaning is that um, we, in that experiment, we had larger beams and therefore we were scanning the average of more terahertz modes. And of course, each one of these terahertz mode is, of course, is random. And therefore, you, you know, you're sort of are averaging over more modes. That means that your average number goes down. Whereas uh, when we are able to focus the beams, then we enhance, of course, the we measure more fluctuations. Um, for a limit is, okay. It is more, you can think of the free limit if you think about Okay, for example, what is the bandwidth of my measurement? So you say, well, I'm definitely limited by the length of my pulse. But before you're limited by length of the pulse, uh, you're limited by the uh, phase matching inside the crystal. And that, in a sense, is what defines our bandwidth more than the uh, um, more than than just the pulse length. 
Did I answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I, I, have, I have another question. So, I mean, uh, you, you, you see that the causal contribution is always anti-correlated somehow. I mean, is it depending some of the distances or, or is it really something very general? Huh, that's a good question. Uh, and I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that one. Um, this really comes out uh, from the simulation. Um, and is there a is there really an an intuitive explanation for that? Um, you could maybe you could argue is that if you have an anti-causal, if you have a causal situation, it means you basically have a propagation time. Um, and that propagation time then will shift perhaps the, sh the, the phase uh, because you start to be comparable to half the wavelength. I don't know if that is that that could be an explanation that I honestly that I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, probably it's, yeah, it's connected to the, the frequency range that you are measuring and the distance. Yeah. Of range. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, any other questions? Anyone else in the audience has any question? Um, yeah, maybe just a, a quick question. Sorry, hi. Um, well, thanks for a nice talk. And, and, and since we are, you know, that these, these, these pictures, you were looking at, at you know, electrical field of strongly focused pulses. Um, does that, you know, and, and it's, it's all like in free space and you have propagating modes. Um, I guess several people have looked at this before. Um, and and do you have sort of like a, a way of um, comparing what, what you do there with what people do with, you know, single molecules or single atoms? Um. I mean, so 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 there. I guess there's some community that that also uses these strongly focused fields and and, and looks at quantization behavior. There is is that a similar expression? Is I mean, it looks almost identical to me. <laughs> um, let's say, you mean in terms of of interrogating single. You, you mean in terms of doing single atom spectroscopy or. Well, you 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 have you are writing down an electromagnetic field mode and and look at these strongly focused modes, and 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 um, and are you using similar expressions or is a similar you know mechanism that you use um, for 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 that field quantization that allows you to talk about vacuum fluctuations than what what uh, you know what people do in this, this atom and molecular business? Because in the atom and molecular business, typically. I mean, the way, I mean, okay, if I, let's say, if I try to compare that with what I know, um, you know, from more in that sense would be more of the, of the circuit 3D type of approach, what we're doing is definitely a dispersive measurement. So we're not, you know, we are interrogating at the at the frequency, which is totally different as all the ref, all the, because we're, you know, exploiting this, Nonlinearity, this chi two effect, and that chi two effect is really a uh, completely off resonant effect. Huh? You know, no, I, I, that, but, but I, 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 I think I understand that. No, it's just no, the question sure. of how you do the, the the field quantization must be, you know, very uh, similar, I guess. Then, okay, then... you mean in terms of the theory now, rather? Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the the theory is really at that point very. I don't want to say straightforward, but mm. it's, you know, it is really this microscopic uh, electrodynamics is really, uh, it's, the, I mean, it's not easy to do it right, but it has nothing conceptually special. Okay, you know? okay, so, 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 yeah. so it, 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 it's, it's really a great standard. Standard. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what I, what I thought. Yeah, yeah. sorry, I, I was, I, you know, I didn't realize, 
But of course, I mean, you should talk to the theoreticians. No, no, I... <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, but, and I don't want to sort of downplay the difficulty what they do. No, no, I, I guess you, you, you quoted some, some you know, observations from the Leifenstorfer gang and, and uh, you know, thought, okay, yeah, that, that's sort of like, I, I guess, very prominent in the, the Short Pulse uh, community. Oh. Um, yes. And I was just wondering, you know, whether there yes. was a comparison between, you know, what, what the short pulse community is doing yes, yes. Okay. versus what, see, what, you know, atomic okay. physics so, I mean, been doing. Absolutely. Uh, the, you see, the big difference, if you want, is that we are still in the, in the fully perturbative regime, meaning our pulse are short, but they're not intense in that, in the sense of intense field, because we are measuring, if you want, our measurement is completely scalable down to zero power. It's just that we would need to integrate for longer times. Whereas mm. in, in the experiments, and the I mean, starting from the second paper of Leighton Stoffer, they try to show squeezing. And of course, squeezing, that is, of course, an inherent high field. And that's, they see that as a modification, of course, a dynamical modification of the refractive index. Uh, that, if you want, is equivalent. And that's, of course, a nice mapping. They can do that to the gravitational curvature uh, induced by the uh, by a black hole, for example. Uh, right. Okay. Thanks. Maybe I just you know need to get used more to the language that that, that you guys. Are yeah, no, I know it's okay. <laughs> I think it's that, that, you know it would be would be actually interesting to do a, a mapping between between your know, what, what 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 you do and what what on your other um your um people uh, are doing or have been doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, the simplest so far, the simplest mapping is to say. They've been working in the nonlinear regime, uh, in this regime where, if you want, in the strong measurement measurement, I would say. I mean, because you see, in the end, <clears throat> their measurement is at the limit of you know being able to resolve because they have this, uh, you know, their measurement. They have this noise equivalent field of six point five kilovolt per meter and a measurement. Um, they are measuring vacuum fluctuation of two kilovolts. So they are mm. like three to one. It's at the edge of being kind of a strong measurement. And we are in a completely perturbative regime. But what we do is we do these correlation measurements. They do only a single beam measurement. And that, of course, is a big difference. Right, right, right. I, I guess, yeah. Maybe I would be we, just nice, uh, but it was, was good to see see that. And maybe one can, you know, we should have a look and make, make a comparison how atomic physics you know or quantum optics experiments not in this strongly uh, you know perturbative regime um, but but sort of like the weaker coupling regime uh, compared to what, what, yeah. what you thanks a lot okay no thank you thank you for the suggestion it's very nice yeah okay do we have another question uh, maybe a last one Well, I have a kind of general question. So, of course, you mentioned all these Unruh de Witt effect and so on. I mean, these are things that some theorists are very uh, speculating a lot about. Um, are you uh, discussing with some of them, or um, have they picked up the idea that maybe they could test their uh, predictions with similar systems? I think there, honestly, it is the theory group around Alfred Leitensdorfer, so Moskalenko, and uh, uh, and uh, Guido Burkhardt mm -hmm. really pushing, if you want, that edge in the theory. And to be honest, I'm not myself pushing in that direction uh, so much because um, it really in involves this high nonlinear optics, which I'm not, you know, we don't have the technology. Okay. And um, it's, it's a very specialized technology. And that's why, in a sense, I'm more interested in pushing what we can do with this correlation uh, further, I mean, I don't know exactly now what what we will be doing next, but let's say it's it's trying to exploit this correlation and the fact that we can really do those sub wavelength totally sub cycle sub wavelength measurements on on the uh, you know on on the field. <clears throat> okay, so well, if there is no more question, then I think we. Uh... We can all thank uh, Jerome for his uh, very nice talk. And uh, um, well, uh, thank you to all uh, to attended. And uh, well, see you to the next colloquium and maybe see you live once. Yeah, well, okay. thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot.